Good morning. My name is Margaret Gruten. I'm co-chair of the Neuropsychoanalysis Committee at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California. We, on behalf of PINK and the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Found in Translation Day with Mark Solms. Um, during this day, we'll get a clearer picture of Freud the man and natural scientist through Dr. Solms' own monumental achievement of translating the entire um, psychological works of Sigmund Freud. In the afternoon, we will hear how psychoanalysis can be enriched and strengthened with its interaction with neuroscience. But first, let me do some logistics. As you know, there's coffee, tea, and water um, in the back. Uh, a hallway leading off of there um, contains restrooms for everyone. Um, I want to um, also make you aware that a videographer is filming this event so that questions you may ask uh, will be part of a uh, eventual CD of these two lectures. Um, we will begin um, with um, uh, Freud in translation, German to English. Um, we will take audience questions around 11.15, break for lunch about 12.15, resume at 1.30, and end the program at 4. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, my distinguished fellow coordinator, Charles Fisher. Charles is chair of the American Psychoanalytic Association's Fund for Psychoanalytic Research. He's a training and supervising analyst at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis and a personal and supervising analyst at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California. So without further ado, Chuck. Thanks, Margaret, and uh, thanks to Mark for coming this long way. We're really thrilled to, uh, to have you here. Thank you all for uh, coming on a uh, Sunday, and uh, looking forward to the program very much. Uh, I do uh, want to uh, mention that uh, you will find on the uh, table a uh, sheet that says uh, topics to consider. This is my, uh, a result of my fantasy that uh, during lunch, uh, people may wish to talk about a couple of provocative topics related to uh, the morning program and uh, related to uh, uh, Mark's comments on uh, translating Freud from uh, German to English. Uh, so if you are so inclined, after you receive box lunches, uh, you're invited to come back to your table or perhaps somebody else's table and uh, discuss the uh, topics to consider or anything else. So uh, with that, I'd uh, like to say a, a few words uh, about Mark. And uh, you know that uh, Mark is a native speaker of both German and English, which uh, enable him to, uh, and I don't know what else, perhaps Afrikaans? Afrikaans, uh, probably more. Uh, he is the research chair of the International Psychoanalytical Association and also chair of the science department of the American uh, Psychoanalytic Association. In addition, he is the founder of the International Neuropsychoanalysis Society and founding editor of the journal Neuropsychoanalysis. He is the 2011 recipient of the Sigourney Award for Psychoanalysis. He holds the Chair of Neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, Gruchuda Hospital, uh, and he is a president of the South African Psychoanalytical Association. So Mark spoke in this auditorium in uh, 2015. Uh, a number of people who are here today were probably uh, here on that occasion. Uh, but uh, I want to go back to it because he then uh, talked in detail about his experiences 
coming to terms with the history of slavery and apartheid in South Africa. He had left the country for many years, but returned after the democratic elections in 1994. Returning uh, to a, uh, his uh, wine estate, family wine estate in the Franschhoek Valley that had been in his family for many generations, he wanted to run it collaboratively with the tenants on the land. This proved impossible for reasons he could not fathom at first. Viewing, from the, viewing the problem from the point of view of a psychoanalyst, he set about exploring what had happened that had made communication impossible. Employing archeologists to investigate who had lived on the land in the distant past, and videographers to document oral histories of uh, the tenant families who currently lived on the land. He traced the history and prehistory of the people who lived there. Much of what was learned is presented in the Museum of Andikab, a remarkable museum on Mark's uh, Solms Delta estate. When my wife Leah and I visited there in 2011, we were very moved by the museum's searchingly honest and respectful presentation of the history of the people on the land. When European settlers arrived several centuries ago, they thought they were encountering uncivilized people. The Khoisan people who uh, lived there had an equally unflattering impression of the Europeans who were arriving. These two points of view are displayed side by side on plaques in the museum. So just striking, dramatic, and wonderful to see it. Mark's powerful compassion and his ability to look rigorously at important questions from multiple perspectives appear throughout his work. We will hear today how he looks in depth at the controversies about translating Freud from German into English and later about translating psychoanalysis into neuroscience. I hope you will feel enlightened as I have been by his passion and his thinking. Before turning the microphone over to Mark, I must mention two things. First, Mark and his neighbor Richard Astor, who owns an adjacent wine estate, have jointly purchased a third estate, which they gave to the workers and residents. I believe the workers now own a substantial percentage, perhaps 45%, I'm not sure the exact uh, amount, of the business of Solms Delta. Second, they actually do uh, make wine there, and it is excellent, and it can be obtained here in the U.S. Uh, through a company called Cape Arter. So with that, <laughs> invite Mark to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marjorie and Chuck. I'm not sure whether any laws were broken by Chuck there. <laughs> um, well, I'm very glad to be here again. Uh, I remember very well uh, the, the, the occasion that Chuck referred to. I believe I gave two papers on that occasion, one of them on um, Solms Delta and one about brain mechanisms of dreaming. Um, so once again, I'm giving you two lectures, although this time I think the, um, the continuity between them is probably um, deeper. Um, it might seem uh, to talk, first of all this morning as I am, uh, about the translation of Freud from German into English uh, to be a very different topic from the translation of Freud's psychoanalysis into neuroscience. In fact, you'll see uh, as I proceed that there's, there's a great deal of overlap uh, between these two topics, surprising as that may um, appear to be. Um, I have, you know, there are people who have standard talks and they run around the world giving the same talk over and over again, which is very easy, um, if perhaps a little boring. Um, but this is not one uh, of those talks. I've, I was going to say written, I, I haven't quite written anything, but I've prepared this talk, uh, this morning's talk and this afternoon's talk specifically for this occasion. Um, that's good because you're not going to find that you've already heard it all on YouTube. Um, 
because it, it's not there. Uh, but what's uh, the downside of this approach is that I, I, I kind of don't know exactly what I'm going to say. Um, and I'm specifically not sure uh, how it will fit into the times that have been allocated to me. Um, I think this morning's presentation will rather comfortably fit into the time allocated. I think this afternoon's might squeeze, uh, might push the boundaries a little bit. So um, we'll probably, I'll be stealing some of your discussion time this afternoon for myself um, and uh, 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 giving you perhaps even some of my presentation time for discussion this morning. Um, for that reason, and also because, as I said, these two talks actually, as you will see as I proceed, have, have deep uh, uh, continuities. Do feel free during the discussion this morning to begin to raise questions um, that, that might more obviously pertain to this afternoon's topic. We don't have to stick to narrowly prescribed linguistic uh, matters uh, this morning. Um, those preliminaries out of the way, uh, let's start. When I was appointed as the editor of the new standard edition, which was an embarrassingly long time ago, uh, actually a little more than 20 years ago, the major question that I faced was whether or not we need to start afresh. Uh, do I start with the German texts and translate them as if they had never been translated before? Or do I start with the existing standard edition translation by James Strachey and revise it. Uh, the reason that uh, this question had to be asked at all, indeed the reason why um, there was a need for a new edition of Freud's complete works was because Strachey's translation had become rather controversial. So I had to immerse myself in the critical literature um, around Strachey's translation in order to come to a decision uh, in relation to this question. Is Strachey's translation good enough, to quote Winnicott, uh, or do we need something better and do I need to start from scratch? Um, of, there were uh, some, well ultimately it turned out to be 49 new titles that had not previously been translated that um, are in the, the new standard edition. Obviously, when it comes to those papers, I had to translate them afresh. Um, but what to do about those that had been translated already? And do I translate the 49 new titles using the same technical vocabulary that Strachey had concocted uh, for the standard edition? Or do I take account of all of these uh, extreme criticisms of Strachey's choices um, and come up with an entirely new technical vocabulary? Uh, this question was complicated by the fact that I was not only um, tasked with uh, producing a new standard edition of Freud's psychological writings, but also with the uh, editing and translating of Freud's complete neuroscientific works. Um, perhaps all of you know, there was a time that it wasn't that well known, that Freud had for 20 years been a very productive neuroscientific researcher. Uh, and that if you count um, the smaller review papers, he published well over 200 titles as a neuroscientist. And uh, it's something of a travesty that these works are still almost entirely inaccessible to the English-speaking reader. So the publishers decided we should take the opportunity of bringing out an additional four volumes of Freud's complete neuroscientific works so that the 28 volumes together will comprise for the first time the complete works of Sigmund Freud, or at least the complete published works, because of course there are also all of those voluminous correspondences. Um, when uh, translating Freud's neuroscientific works, because interestingly, as you will see, uh, there were many terminological continuities in other words, words, technical terms that Freud used as an anatomist um, and as a, um, a behavioral neurologist um, that he also used uh, in his psychoanalytical writings. Uh, I needed to come to decisions as to whether those technical terms um, should be 
uh, the same as those that Strachey had chosen um, all those decades ago. So immersing myself as I, as I had to in the critical literature about Strachey's translation, uh, it becomes clear that there, th there's essentially one fundamental criticism of those translations. Nobody says they're bad English. Uh, uh, Strachey was a master of the English language. He was uh, Lytton Strachey's brother. He was a member of the Bloomsbury group. He spoke and wrote beautiful Victorian English. Uh, there was no way that um, a colonist or colonialist like me uh, from the southern tip of Africa was going to be able to produce better English than Strachey. The question rather revolved around the manner in which he translated straight, uh, Freud's technical vocabulary. The charge uh, quoting here from Laplanche, the actual words that Laplanche used, was that Strachey falsely scientized Freud. Um, I, I, I quote uh, Laplanche there because he puts it so pithily, but really that is the fundamental criticism throughout the secondary literature on the standard edition. Brunt, in 1961 already, basically said the same thing. He said, we Germans, when we read Freud in Strachey's English, don't recognize him. Uh, our Freud speaks an ordinary, everyday, descriptive German. Uh, but the Freud in Strachey's uh, translation is a scientist. He speaks in a technical, abstract, third-person, mechanistic sort of way. Um, and this is not our Freud. Bettelheim took up the cudgels uh, in a really quite vociferous way in his uh, famous book, Freud and Man's Soul, published in 1983, and said essentially the same thing um, with great emotion, that uh, Freud was a humanist, Freud was such a cultured man, uh, Freud was, uh, was, a, was a, 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 a beautiful uh, speaker and writer of the German language, he won the Goethe Prize, and so on. Um, and that he brought uh, to um, the world a, 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 a profoundly accessible, immediately uh, understandable, one could identify with, one could discover oneself in the, in, in the, 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 the terminology that Freud used in German. Uh, that the Freud that we read in English is utterly different. He's a, he's a scientist, he's a mechanist, um, he's, he's aloof. He's distant, uh, he describes things in abstract third-person uh, terms, and uh, Bettelheim went so far as to blame the veritable demise of psychoanalysis in America uh, on Strachey's translation. He said that anybody who read Freud in the German would understand these are just self-evident truths. This is a description of something that we all know, we all identify with, we can all understand, see in ourselves and in others in our dreams, in our fantasies, in our, in our relationships, in our way of being. But this, this scientific, mechanistic, ego-psychology uh, that Strachey uh, um, uh, perpetrated um, is, is, is simply not psychoanalysis. Um, the uh, Germans uh, emigres like Bettelheim, uh, they, they use a the phrase, uh, bei uns war es immer besser. It was always better with us. <laughs> Ornston, who's an American, uh, but married to a German, uh, made much the same argument in a series of papers. Um, I, I've uh, cited just one of them there, one of the, uh, one of the, um, the, the better known ones, um, where, where the title of the paper was Freud's conception is different from Strachey's, and conception uh, was um, a, a technical term. Um, all of them, in essence, as I say, uh, make one fundamental criticism of uh, Strachey, and that is that he falsely scientizes Freud. Now, I told you there are going to be some, some uh, uh, quite surprisingly deep links between my two papers today, and perhaps you can already see why this is the case, because uh, I'm going to be talking this afternoon um, about scientizing Freud in the sense of bringing psychoanalysis into the neurosciences and bringing neuroscience into psychoanalysis, which has also been a very controversial um, <laughs> exercise, a very uh, controversial enterprise, and it revolves around much the same question. Is psychoanalysis really science? Uh, 
Uh, are we not perhaps doing violence to what psychoanalysis is all about by turning it into um, a natural science? Uh, it was a Freud not a, a, a more of a hermeneuticist? Um, is this not, uh, how can it be possible to have a natural science of, of, of psychological meaning and purpose um, and motivation, the sorts of things that psychoanalysis is all about? So here's the question. This is the question I'm going to be addressing with you. Uh, depending on time, it might be the only question I address with you this morning. We'll see how we go. Um, did Strachey falsely scientize Freud? Um, here is, oh wait, I think I skipped a slide. Yep. Here is the first technical term that we will consider. Um, I've chosen this one uh, for two reasons. Um, the first reason being that it's um, a term which um, earned Strachey withering criticism from Laplanche uh, in the form that I've quoted on the slide. Uh, Laplanche says of uh, Strachey's term, anaclysis, that it is a lifeless and barbaric term. In German, anaclysis is anlernung, which literally translated means leaning on, anlernung leaning on. That's what it means. Any German speaker, upon reading Anlernung, will understand that means leaning on, or leaning upon, or leaning up against, or prop propping, or something like that. It's an ordinary descriptive term. Uh, it's transparent in its meaning. Did Strachey translate it as leaning on, or leaning upon? No. He translated it as anaclysis, from the ancient Greek. In fact, in this case, from the very ancient Greek. And uh, this um, is the sort of thing that attracted uh, this, uh, this claim, this assertion, this bewilderment as to why on earth uh, would Strachey do this? Why invent a neologism? Why invent a neologism from ancient Greek, for God's sake, you know, for something which is so transparently meaningful in the German? Who knows what anaclysis means? Nobody's ever heard of it because it's not a word. It's not an English word at all. Lifeless and barbaric. The same can be said for besetzung. I told you there were two reasons why I started with anaclysis. I've only given you one of them. I'll come to the second reason in a moment. But the same can be said for besetzung. Besetzung uh, is, again, a perfectly straightforward, ordinary, uh, everyday term. It means occupy. An army occupies a city. It besetzes the city. Um, in fact, if you sit in the lavatory and you slide the latch, it says besetzed, means it's occupied. Um, nobody is in any doubt, if they're German, as to what besetzed means. It means don't go in there. Somebody else is in there already. Um, in fact, it has other meanings too, the word besetzung, I'll come back to that uh, much later, but my point for, this, for, for the moment, um, and my main point is simply that it's a word that any German will understand. Who among you, before you were introduced to the arcane language of Strachey-esque psychoanalysis, had ever heard of cathexis? Well, you can't have, because it, is, it only exists in the arcane a world of Strachey-esque psychoanalysis. There was no such word in English before Strachey chose to use cathexis from the ancient Greek for Freud's ordinary besetzum. So these two uh, terms uh, are iconic uh, in the controversy surrounding the way in which Strachey scientized, falsely scientized Freud. I'll come back, as I said, to the second reason why I'm starting with anaclysis, but I wanted to just show you by adding besetzung uh, that it's by no means an um, unusual or, or isolated uh, occurrence, uh, anaclysis. Uh, there, there are many terms uh, in Strachey's translation about which these sorts of criticisms can be made and have been made. Here's a list of them. Well, when I say a list of them, I mean this is a sort of list off the top of my head. Um, it's by no means an exhaustive list. It's just, as I was trying to make this slide, I thought, well, let me list some obvious uh, 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 other terms that have been uh, 
So, uh, so um, uh, uh, given, given a cause for such unhappiness. Einfühlung, which means feeling into. It's very, it, 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 that's literally what it means. You don't need to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst to know what Einfühlung means. It means feeling your way into something. Uh, Regung is a stirring. It's a, it's a perturbation. Um, stirring is the, would be the obvious English word. Schaulust means pleasure in looking. Again, you don't need to have studied the, the subject uh, to know what Schaulust means. It means Lust in Schau, in looking or showing. Fellleistung, again, literally translated, it's very easy to understand what it means. A Leistung is a performance. A Fehler is an error. So a Fellleistung is a faulty performance. It's a doing of something wrongly. It's an erroneous performance. Clearly, clearly transparent in its meaning. Here's yeah, something slightly different, the Zähler. Zähler is the soul. It's, uh, it's the ordinary word for, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you feel yourself to still exist, thank God. It's the thing that you're experiencing is the existence of your Zähle, of your soul. I'm still here. Um, speaking of I am still here, Ich means I. Uh, there's, again, it's the most obvious uh, term. In fact, it's the most commonly used word in the German language. It's the first person pronoun singular, I. You know, like me. As opposed to S, which means it. So this is me, and that's not me. It's it. Um, and über uh, ich, I thought I would just complete the, the, the triad there, uh, means something like above me or over I. Um, <laughs> All of these are easily understandable words. Here are Strachey's translations of them. Uh, rather than feeling into for Einfühlung, he puts empathy, which, by the way, is Greek. Regung, or stirring, he calls an impulse. Why would he do that? An impulse is a rather different thing from a stirring. An impulse is a, it's something sort of digital, whereas a stirring or rousing um, it, 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 it loses all of its feeling. It loses all of its psychology. Schaulust, he calls it scopophilia. It's a horrible disease. <laughs> <laughs> a Fellleistung, which, as I said, it's easy to see what it means. It means a faulty action, a faulty performance. Uh, he calls it a parapraxis. Again, Greek, literally. Zähler, which, as I said, means soul. Interestingly, Strachey translates this as mind, which is, you know, is your mind the same as your soul? It's, 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 and this is the thing that Bettelheim got his knickers in such a twist about. You know, they're, 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 this gives the, his book its title, Freud and Man's Soul. You know, Freud and Man's Mind is not quite the same as Freud and Man's Soul. And he literally makes the argument that Strachey has stripped Freud of his soul in his translation. Um, ish, which, as I said, means I, he calls it ego. You know, I mean, I know what I am, I, 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 but I can't think of myself as ego. You know, it's like weird. Uh, that's Latin. Uh, S, which means it. Again, he has recourse to Latin, the id. Nobody's ever heard of an id, but everyone knows what it means. It means something other than what I am. It's something I don't identify with. I identify with the I. I don't identify with the it. It's something foreign, something that, that I have to contend with. Um, and über ich, as I said, it's a, well, that is actually a neologism of Freud's. Uh, that, 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 but still, you know what it means. By the way, in German, you are allowed to neologize all the time. If you want to make up a new word, it's fine. You just do it like, like Shakespeare did. You just sort of like bang some... Um, existing German words together and you create a new word. Like, my favorite is ungeschehen machen, which means making unhappened. You know, you can, you can just turn it into a word, which in this case, Strachey translated as undoing one of the defense mechanisms. But the point being that über ich, again, it means something. It's transparent. It's, 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 it's evocative of a certain kind of imagery. You understand immediately just on encountering the word what it means. But that doesn't apply to the superego. What is a superego? Sounds like a comic book hero or something. 
a Latin comic book hero. <laughs> So, so these, these are, as I say, more or less off the top of my head, uh, further examples of this scientizing of Freud, this te 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 technicalization of Freud, this mechanization of Freud, this abstracting of Freud, this distancing of uh, the meaning, uh, this neologizing, this Greekifying and Latinizing uh, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, earned Strachey's translation such a program. Now remember the question that we are addressing is the question that I had to address upon taking on this task of revising the translation of Freud. Do I, do I stick with this technical terminology with which we are now all so familiar? Or is it so fundamentally flawed that we need to take a deep breath and start all over again and translate Freud more in a way that a German reader would recognize this is the same person uh, that, I, that I read in my, in my native language. Okay, so here goes. We're now answering the question. Well, Strachey starts out in his preface to the standard edition, which he wrote in 1961, I mean the preface, that is. He said um, very explicitly what policy he was following in his translation. He said, I'm imagining Freud as an English man of science, of wide education, born in the middle of the 19th century. The one thing that's uncontroversial is that Freud was born in the middle of the 19th century. But uh, I have underlined uh, the two bits uh, that, that, that are the, the cause of all the fuss. Why make Freud an English man of science? He was an Austrian man of science. And why make him a man of science? I mean, was he more a man of science than a man of letters? Uh, well, Strachey at least was explicit that this is what he was doing. He was imagining Freud as a man, an English man of science. Let's address these two questions separately. The question of Freud as an Englishman and the question of Freud as a scientist. The first bit is actually the easiest bit. In translation, there really are two alternative ways of going about it. Obviously, in translation, there are two languages. There's what we call the source language, in other words, the text you're translating from. And then there's the target language, which is the language that you're translating into. And you can either write in the style, in the, using the conventions, um, uh, using the, 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 the way of speaking uh, of the source language, or you can do so in the form of the target language. You can't do both. The question as to which is the right way to translate, do you literally convert the German into English, which can be done, or by convert, I mean sort of something like Google Translate does. You know, just take the word and give the English equivalent word and take the grammar and more or less, you know, just don't lose anything. If, 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 if the word is ungeschehen machen, then say, making unhappened. You know, if the word is nachträglichkeit, then say, afterwardsness. Even if such a word doesn't exist in English, in German you're allowed to do that, as I told you. So if you're translating literally, you'll do something like that. And um, to be frank, if you'll excuse the pun, that's what Laplanche did. Uh, Laplanche was in charge of a team of translators who produced the new uh, French edition of Freud, and he did it by translating literally. Now, there's no, as I said, right or wrong way of doing this. You have to make a choice. Whichever way you go, you're going to lose something. You're either going to have funny English, but at least it's literally the, uh, the same as the German, or you're going to have beautiful English, but it's going to have distorted the German. In, in, in Italian, they have a, they have a phrase uh, translated, it is translator, traitor, uh, which con conveys uh, the, the essence of the dilemma. That if you're going to translate, you have to betray uh, one language or the other, because no two languages are, are alike in their lexicon, in their, in their denotations, let alone their connotations. Um, there, there's a whole world th uh, that comes with a language which can't be uh, 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 easily transposed. Uh, it's, there's something that has to be lost. So either you are faithful to the source language 
in which case it looks like funny English. And uh, I quoted Bellos, is a wonderful book by Bellos on translation. He says, literal translation runs the risk of dissolving into something different, a representation of the funny ways that foreigners speak. You know? and that's, how it, that's what happens if you translate literally. You, know, you sound like a foreigner trying to speak English, uh, using uh, your, your, your source language as the basis. Um, Octavio Paz, who wrote a, 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 actually the most masterly book on translation, said literal translation is not impossible, but it's not translation. You know? uh, and all of these uh, phrases, the, including the Italian one I quoted to you, uh, speak to the, the, the controversy about you know, writing in the style uh, of the source language or the style uh, of the target language. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way to go about it. There literally is something lost either way. You just have to make a choice and take the consequences. But uh, choice there has to be made between these two approaches. So when Strait says he imagined Freud as an English man of science, he was making his choice, and at least he was explicit about it. He's saying, I'm writing Freud in English. Uh, I'm not going to write Freud uh, in, in, in funny pidgin English, uh, which will be closer to the German. Um, what's the justification for Strachey uh, uh, doing that? I don't know. I, I mean, I'll tell you what the justification is, but I don't want to give you the impression that it's the right way. I'm just making plain the fact that one loses something either way. Um, the justification is that that's how Freud translated. Freud was, I don't know how many of you know this, Freud was an accomplished translator. Uh, Freud translated two volumes of Charcot's lectures from French into German. And when he did so, he imagined Charcot as a German man of science, uh, of wide education, uh, born in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, he, uh, he also translated from English into German. Uh, the uh, um, essays on human understanding he translated, for example. And um, he translated uh, in his neurological uh, years, um, from Spanish into German, from Italian into German, um, and the are little bits and pieces uh, of, of Freud was in, in, incredibly, when Strachey said he imagined him as a man of wide education, there's no question about the width of his education. So the justification, if you need any, for Strachey making that choice was that that was the way that Freud himself translated. Now, uh, while I'm uh, on that point, uh, I might mention that uh, Freud oversaw Strachey's translations. I don't know uh, how many people are aware of that. Uh, Strachey, I mean, it was the boundaries uh, between Freud and Strachey were, were a bit questionable by modern um, uh, uh, standards. Uh, Strachey was a patient of Freud's, and uh, he would go for his analytic hour, and then he would come back in the afternoon and discuss the translation uh, while he was living in Vienna. Uh, and uh, Freud really literally oversaw, literally supervised uh, Strachey's translation. Uh, all of these terms about which there's so much controversy, uh, it has to be said that Freud explicitly endorsed uh, Strachey's translations of all of these terms. Uh, I'll come back to that also later. But I'll mention in passing that Strachey was also not the first translator of Freud. There was already a long-standing tradition of translating Freud into English. In fact, Freud was first translated into English when Strachey was a schoolboy. And uh, many of the choices that Strachey made, he inherited from his predecessors. Um, but I'll come back to that later also, if I have enough time. So that's the first question. Um, is, was Strachey right to imagine Freud as an Englishman of science? Uh, well, you lose something either way. He did it that way because that was Freud's way of translating and that was the way that Freud therefore approved uh, of his translations. But now what about the second question, the question of Freud as a man of science? The oddest thing about the charge that Strachey falsely scientized Freud was that Freud's own view of himself was nothing but that he was a scientist. Freud was self-consciously a scientist. Freud was defensively a scientist. Freud was embarrassed whenever, whenever he found himself doing something which didn't feel properly like science. Uh, some of you might remember that wonderful footnote in um, the Dora case, uh, where Freud says, and he says, 
something like uh, he apologizes to his readers uh, if these case studies uh, read like short stories um, and uh, that they lack, as it were, the serious stamp of science. And he said, uh, he must, uh, he, must uh, he asks us to understand that this is through no choice of his own. It appears that the subject matter demands it, that one has to write in this, in this way as if one were writing a romance rather than one was doing proper science. Uh, here in his, um, uh, some elementary lessons on psychoanalysis, which was Freud's last word on the matter, um, published posthumously, there he makes this interesting statement. He says, psychology is a natural science. What else can it be? This is the Freud who Strachey is supposed to have falsely scientized. Forgive this very long quote, but it's really the most interesting. It really richly rewards uh, 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 your attention. This is the most interesting comment that Freud made on this whole topic of translation. So this is why um, I, I've quoted it at length. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly read it to you. We, he, this is in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. He says, we need not feel greatly disturbed in judging our speculation upon the life and death drives by the fact that so many bewildering and obscure processes occur in it, such as one drive being driven out by another, or a drive turning from the ego to an object, and so on. This is not merely due to our being obliged to operate with the scientific terms, that is to say, with the figurative language peculiar to psychology, or more precisely to depth psychology, we could not otherwise describe the processes in question at all, and indeed we could not even become aware of them. I've underlined that sentence not because it's the most important one, but to remind you I'm going to come back to it later. Here comes the really important part. He says, the deficiencies in our description would probably vanish if we were already in a position to replace the psychological terms by physiological and chemical ones. It's true that they too are only part of a figurative language, but it's one with which we have long been familiar and which is perhaps a simpler one as well. Now, as I said, this, center, this, para, this passage richly rewards careful reading in relation to the question we are considering here this morning. I'm not going to go into all of those meanings uh, 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 yet. I'll, I will pick up on some of them later. But I want you to please remember that this is the Freud that's supposed to have been falsely scientized. The one who says that we are obliged to operate with scientific terms uh, and who goes on to say that it, 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 the, the deficiencies in this terminology would probably vanish if we were already in a position to replace the psychological terms by physiological and chemical ones. How can you falsely scientize a man like this? Okay, so I've set the scene. Now let's get into the meat and veggies. I said that I had to answer this question for myself um, as to whether or not to stick with Strachey's um, uh, technical vocabulary, uh, not only in my capacity as the editor of the revised psychological works, but also in my capacity as the editor of Freud's neuroscientific works. And I said that one of the reasons why I had to um, consider the question from both of these points of view is precisely because there were terms that Freud used in his psychological works which, were, which also appear in his neuroscientific works. Here's the example that I chose to give you um, because of um, Laplanche's charge that anaclysis was a lifeless and barbaric term. Uh, he, he used this as an outstanding example of the way in which Strachey falsely scientized Freud, uh, turned Freud from the speaker of an ordinary, transparent, uh, everyday descriptive language into this, into this mechanist. In uh, a paper that he wrote um, on the spinal cord of a lowly vertebrate called petromycin, uh, Freud discovered a new kind of nerve fiber. He was very proud of, of this little discovery because it was in 1878 and he was still very young. And he, he described these fibers that he discovered as angelanter fasern. Angelanter is the adjectival form, form of anlernung, the word anaclysis that I mentioned at the beginning. Anlernung, uh, an angelanter faser is a leaning on type of fiber. Here is Freud's drawing of angelanter fasern. Uh, but by the way, I found this drawing. 
I found it in Freud's desk. Believe it or not, in the 1990s, there, there in Freud's desk was this the package of drawings all sort of stuck together, and nobody has realized those were Freud's anatomical drawings, the actual original drawings that he had made. And here, this is not the published drawing, uh, as you can see up here. There, he's actually, he's handwritten, figure one. Uh, and in Angela and Tafasen, uh, well, this thing doesn't really point very well against these colors, but the point is that this is a, ner this is a spinal nerve root, and the angelantophasm are the fibers which attach themselves, they lean on, um, they attach themselves to uh, the, 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 the uh, fibers in the nerve root, but these fibers do not themselves have any independent origin in the root, so they just attach themselves to the branches of the roots uh, of the actual um, uh, 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 nerve root fibers. And so he named them Angelantafasen. Now, when I translated this term in the neuroscientific works, I faced this choice. Do I call these leaning on fibers, or do I call them anaclytic fibers? Because clearly this is a very interesting continuity. When Freud used the word Anlernung in his psychological technical vocabulary, he knew that this was the very same word that he had used to describe how this one type of nerve fiber sort of, sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of piggybacks upon uh, another sort of nerve fiber. Just as an, an Anlehnung, let me remind you, uh, the, the, the concept of anaclysis is how the attachment to the mother, the affectionate bond to the mother, it leans upon the libidinal uh, 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 tie to the mother. This was Freud's view of how attachment works. That it's uh, that the, the, the one drive uh, um, uh, sort of piggybacks upon a, a pre-existing drive. It doesn't mean dependency or attachment in the sense of attachment theory. The attachment is not of the baby to the mother. The attachment is of the one instinct upon the other, or the one drive upon the other. So, when I translate this term, uh, as I have, uh, I had to decide: Do I use an ordinary descriptive vocabulary? Uh, like everybody said we should, because Freud clearly does. Uh, but it sounds a bit funny to write anatomically about leaning on fibers. Uh, anaclytic fibers somehow doesn't sound so bad uh, in the context of neuroanatomy. Uh, I hope you'd agree. It's sort of, I mean, even though nobody knows what it means, it's still it sort of sounds anatomical. But a, a leaning on fiber sounds a little sort of childish. Uh, why would that be? I mean, why does something that in German sounds fine uh, in English sound childish? And why does something that in English sounds scientific, uh, why, does it, why is it okay to use an ordinary everyday word in the German? This is the nub, uh, I submit, of the matter that we're addressing here. Let me tell you about another anatomical structure. And again, I've chosen these more or less at random. I really have, because what I'm going to say to you in a few examples applies across the board in German anatomy. And by the way, I'm not cherry picking by choosing anatomy um, as my analogy or as my um, point of comparison of Freud's psychoanalytical vocabulary. I'm choosing anatomy because Freud was an anatomist. I mean, he's, as I said, he spent 20 years um, uh, doing neuroscientific research uh, writing more than 200 neuroscientific titles. And so this, he was richly, deeply steeped uh, in the language of neuroanatomy. So in anatomy, uh, in neuroanatomy, um, giving you a, 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 just an off the top of my head example, we have a thing called das Knie des Balkans. And this literally translated means the knee of the beam. I'll show it to you. Here's the beam. I mean, can't you see it's a beam? No? Here's a hemisphere, and it's connected to the other hemisphere through this beam. And at the front of the beam, it sort of bends like a knee. So in German anatomy, we call this the beam, the Balkan. And this we call the knie of the beam, because it's the knee of the Balkan. Can't you see? So, do we in English neuroanatomy have a concept called the knee of the beam? No. It's called the genu of the corpus callosum. <laughs> that's Latin, and that's Latin. 
That's conventional. In neuroanatomy, it's completely conventional to use Latin and Greek terms. It's weird to use everyday descriptive terms like the knee of the beam. It just doesn't cut it at all. Here are some other examples, again, sort of chosen at random. Uh, in the brain, there's a thing called the Brücke, which means the bridge. In the brain, there's a thing called the Vierhäugel, which means the four little hills. Uh, there's a thing called the Kleinhirn, which means nothing but little brain. You know, I mean, when you read about a Brücke, you know it's a bridge. And when you read about four little hills, you know it's four little hills. And when you read about a little brain, you know, well, this is some kind of little brain. You don't need to study uh, for years uh, the arcane language of neuroanatomy to know what sort of thing is being spoken about here. Let me show them to you. Here's the Brücke. It's a bridge. Uh, in fact, this is a sagittal section. If you look at it from the front, you'll see it's a band of fibers which bridges from the one side of the corpus. Sorry, I'll come back to that later. I don't want to mention what that thing's called. But it bridges from one side of it to the other side of it, and this bridge sort of forms around the rest of the brainstem. The, the, um, what was the other term that I used? Fehrhäugel. Okay, here. Here they are. There's one little hill, and there's another little hill. And on the other side of the brain, there are two more. So there are four little hills over there. Bump, bump. And here is the Kleinhirn. Look at it. There's the, there's the Grosshirn, the big brain. And here's the Kleinhirn, the little brain. Wonderful. In English, do we have a concept of the little brain and the bridge and the four hills? Of course not. The Brücke is the Poms. The Vierhäugel is the Cupora quadrigemina. The Kleinhirn is the Cerebellum. And I just added another one for good measure here. You can't see it in the slide. That's why I didn't mention it earlier. But it just occurred to me as I was making this slide. The Borgenfasern, which are arched fibers. Again, you can immediately see what they look like. You know what they are. They're arched fibers in German. But in English, they are not English at all. They're the arcuate fasciculus. So, my dear colleagues and friends, this is conventional. In German scientific writing, we use ordinary everyday descriptive terms. In English scientific writing, we use neologisms from ancient Greek and Latin. It is absolutely standard practice. So it's nothing special about psychology. When Freud, the psychologist, used words like ich and es and Besetzung and Anlernung and Einfühlung and all of these ordinary everyday descriptive terms, he was doing nothing different from what he did as an anatomist. This is how you write in German science. You use ordinary everyday descriptive terms. Um, as I said, straight, you said he's imagining Freud as a man of science. Well, Freud was a man of science. As I showed you, he saw himself as a man of science. So you're not doing any distortion by presenting him as a man of science, he presented himself as a man of science. And you're also not doing any distortion by then using Latinate and Greek terms rather than ordinary everyday descriptive ones, because that's what we do in English science. So if you're imagining Freud as an English man of science, you can't have him speaking funny, uh, childish uh, 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 pigeon anatomy and pigeon psychology in English. That's literally what Strachey would be doing if he had translated, if I, for example, had translated, as I said, the Angelante Fasern as leaning on little fibers rather than anaclytic fibers, which sounds like proper anatomy. For those of you who are feeling a little uncomfortable with all of this anatomical stuff and thinking that it's all too far removed from everyday experience, I thought I would give you these much more familiar examples. I mean, there it speaks for itself. Sauerstoff. Is sour stuff in English? We don't call it sour stuff, we call it oxygen. Wasserstoff, which is water stuff. I mean, any German knows that Wasserstoff is water stuff. In English, we don't have a concept of water stuff. We have a concept of hydrogen. And uh, the, here's a, a, another one for good measure, Stoffwechsel, which means exchange of stuff or stuff exchange <laughs> in English. It's metabolism. So, gosh, what's all that fuss been about? When we go back to these words that I uh, sort of sneeringly told you how, how Strachey had translated them at the beginning, uh, 
I hope that now there's a very different light cast upon them. Uh, once I've showed you nothing special, something any German scientist knows that you write like this, uh, you use ordinary everyday descriptive terms in German science. Uh, it's nothing special to do with psychology. It's what you do if you're writing in German. And every English scientist knows that you can't speak like that as a scientist if you're English. You won't sound like a scientist. Uh, you'll sound retarded. <laughs> Einfühlung, empathy. It's the standard psychological term for Einfühlung. In German, you speak about Einfühlung. In English, you speak about empathy. Interestingly, at the time that Strachey first used that term, it had just been introduced uh, into English sci academic psychology. Uh, it was, I think it was Titchener who introduced it. And it was still a rather strange, awkward word. It hadn't yet penetrated um, into everyday usage. Now we all know what empathy means. And when Freud said in that quote that I said would reward careful study, um, he said that, that the language of physics uh, and chemistry, oops, sorry, physiology and chemistry is more familiar to us. I think that this is a really important point that these words, as they come into everyday usage, they become familiar to us, and we do know what they mean. So although when Strachey first used the word empathy, nobody really knew what it meant, and uh, now we all do know what it means. It's just because it's become more familiar. It's a technical term which has become an everyday one. Uh, while I'm on this point, and I thought I would just sort of ramble a little bit here, I want to tell you that um, I, I said already that Strachey was not the first person to translate Freud into English. That, that the, 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 um, the, the first translations um, were um, made when Strachey was a schoolboy. Um, it was also the case that uh, Strachey was laboring under the direction of a committee called the Glossary Committee, uh, the chair of which was Ernest Jones. And um, uh, Ernest Jones was quite a superego in himself. And uh, Strachey, um, many, uh, many of the translations that um, he's been so um, uh, um, vilified for were in fact not his own choices. They were either terms that he inherited because they were already conventional by the time that he, uh, you know, f 50 years on, or 60 years on in some cases, uh, uh, 60 years on in, in the sense that there were already five or six decades of English translating of Freud, um, uh, 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 in existence by the time that Strachey made the standard edition. Uh, not only that, but he was also bound by this glossary committee. And the glossary committee, in fact, Jones himself decided that Einfühlung shall be empathy. And Strachey uh, really was unhappy about it. And uh, his, his uh, wife, Alex, wrote uh, in sympathy, if you'll excuse that pun, um, to him and said, it's an it's, what did she say? She said it's an aisle and elephantine term for a subtle process. But that no longer applies. We all know what empathy is now. Uh, Regung, uh, which as I said means stirring, again, it's a standard technical term. It's used all the time in physiology. A Regung is an impulse. The, 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 the word that you use in English for a Regung, which Freud didn't discover, I mean, it's a long-standing word in physiology. You can't translate it as anything other than an impulse because that's the standard conventional translation uh, for that in physiology. Uh, Schaulust, well, uh, let me only say about Schaulust that it's the similar sort of principle to Fellleistung. Uh, the Fellleistung, uh, which Strachey translated as parapraxis, he did in the full knowledge that there are all sorts of equivalents in neurology. Um, and the, 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 the one that Freud would have been most familiar with was paraphasia. In fact, Freud first introduced the concept of what Strachey translates as parapraxis. In Freud's, uh, um, Freud first used the term in his writings about paraphasia as an aphasiologist, as a neurologist. Paraphasia is when you mean to say one thing, but you say another. Uh, on, on neurological grounds, the patient uses the wrong word or distorts the word. It's called literal paraphasia or semantic paraphasia. This is an existing concept in behavioral neurology. Freud was very familiar with it, and that's how you translate this. Uh, it's, it's, it's directly on that model. 
like that's why I was saying about Shaulus, the same, all sorts of filias are translated as filias, all sorts of lusts are translated as filias in English, that's just how it's done. He has a different, uh, a slightly different case. Zela, uh, which means soul, uh, but which straightly translated as mind. Well, uh, again, in neurology, there's a precedent. Uh, the, 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 the thing called agnosia, those of you who are neurologists or, or, or know anything about neurology will perhaps know that there's a concept called agnosia. Most, most well known is visual agnosia. Uh, 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 Oliver Sacks' case of the man who mistook his wife for a hat, uh, that man suffered from agnosia. And um, the, when ag the agnosia concept was first introduced into, into science uh, in German uh, neurology, the term that they used was Seelenblindheit, which was then Eng in English translation was, was, was called mind blindness. Uh, and there was also a Seelentaubheit, uh, which was translated as, as mind deafness. Uh, why did they call it mind deafness and mind blindness uh, rather than soul deafness and soul blindness? Well, it's because it's not the same thing. You know, agnosia has got nothing to do with your soul in the metaphysical sense of the word. Agnosia or mind blindness, has, it's a cognitive disorder. It's a disorder of visual recognition. And it's entirely conventional in behavioral neurology, which was one of Freud's fields, that you translate Zähler as mind. Um, and so again, it would have been very odd for Strachey to use the word soul. The word soul has a different connotation in English from what it does in German. Uh, the, 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 the conventions and the traditions that Freud came from, it did not have those metaphysical, uh, theological meanings. It meant the mind, and so it was entirely correct to translate it as mind. Uh, same with ish. Although it's true that literally translated it means I, in, in um, philosophy of mind, in, for example, in Kant, uh, the word ish appears all over the place. And Schopenhauer speaks of das Ich, and people like this had long been translated uh, into English. Uh, they were towering figures in philosophy. There, how, how, were they, how was this concept translated? It was translated as the ego. So if Strachey had decided that he was going to translate Freud's use of this term das Ich, which has such a long-standing tradition in, 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 in um, in German uh, idealist philosophy, uh, if he was going to translate it as the I, it would be idiosyncratic in the extreme. It would be breaking the most obvious intellectual continuities between Freud and what came before him, the traditions of, upon which Freud was building. The terminology that Freud was using, was applying in this new way, it had a long existence before Freud used these terms. And so it really was beholden. It was entirely, it was entirely necessary to translate das Ich as the ego. By the way, there I also want to point out that it's not Ich. Freud isn't saying I, he's saying das Ich, the I. It's a funny sort of thing, the I. It's an abstraction, it's a third person concept. And uh, it's not so weird to speak of the ego. Uh, it would be a little weirder to speak of the I. Uh, and as I say, it would be breaking all of those continuities. By the way, the ego and the id, again, was not Strachey's decision. Uh, the translator of the ego and of das Ich und das Es when it first came out in 1923 was not Strachey, it was Joan Revere. So Joan Revere, under the supervision of the glossary committee, um, used ego and id. Uh, Strachey, interestingly, was unhappy with the use of the word id. Uh, if you'll forgive the, the political incorrectness, he said to his wife, Alex, I'm worried people will say the Yid, uh, you know, and in the anti-Semitic climate uh, within which uh, Freud was writing. But uh, he said that the use of the, of the term Id was selected so as to make it parallel with the ego. The long established ego, said Strachey. The term ego was already long established in, uh, in, 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 in German uh, uh, I mean, in, in English translations of German uh, uh, scientific and academic writing. Once you have uh, the ish as the ego, uh, you can hard, hardly call the uber ish the over I. Um, of course, you then have to, um, uh, on the same principle, use super ego. Now, 
I've made many points here, and I'm rambling a little bit, and I see that I must, mustn't ramble too much longer. But my main point, not to lose sight of it um, in the midst of all the detail, is that when you look at these terms uh, now, in light of everything that I've told you about what is conventional in, the, in, in, in German uh, scientific writing, in German academic writing, as opposed to English uh, scientific writing and English uh, uh, academic writing, then these translations really they don't look so odd at all. There is certainly no distortion. There's certainly no false scientization. It is, it is really uh, the obvious way to translate these terms if you know anything about German science and German uh, academic writing. It would be really odd. It would be a false colloquialization of Freud to use words like feeling into, stirring, pleasuring, looking, faulty performance, soul, I, it, and over I. It really would. In fact, Jones pointed out that there was much unhappiness. There has been much unhappiness for centuries in the academic and scientific fields with the Germans for not using what, what Jones called the international language. They were quite odd in not using, uh, in choosing not to, or in resisting the use of, of Latin and Greek in German scientific writing. It's only in German that you do that. Uh, you don't do it in English. Now, um, I'm sort of, um, I, I want to round off this part of what I'm saying, and then I'll move on to some other topics which will, which will provide some links to this afternoon's talk. Good. It's horrible when your superego tells you to do something that you were going to do anyway. I, I just want to, um, you know, so these are the technical terms. I've spoken about each of these words as if they were little islands unto themselves. But I want to now make a really not very big point, but it's something that does need to be made. You know, these armchair translators who say, oh, well, why don't you translate ish as I and s as it? Uh, I've told you why, uh, why you can't do that. Um, they, they say, well, I'm just, I'll use ube ish as, as an example of the point I'm wanting to make next. They say we, we could translate it as over I. Or, as Ornstein said, we should translate it as I over myself. That's literally, I mean, really, seriously, Ornstein seriously suggested that we should translate Ubi-ish as I over myself. Wow. You know, Ubi-ish comes in all sorts of cognate forms, as do all of these terms. They all come in all sorts of cognate forms. You have Ubi-ish Analyse, you have Ubi-ish Bildung, you have Ubi-ish Funktion. So this is the superego analysis. Superego formation, superego function, superego agency, superego resistance. These are, as I told you, in German, you can just bang words together. You're allowed to do that. How do you translate über ich Widerstand as I, the resistance of the I over myself? I mean, you just can't do it in, in, in real, actual translation. It's completely unsustainable, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of nonsenses. Okay, so at this point, I want to reach a pre preliminary conclusion with 14 minutes to go, <laughs> um, which is that on the basis of this, um, these considerations, I made the choice to stick with Strachey's technical vocabulary. Um, by the way, perhaps I should have started this whole presentation by telling you this, that I know that by entering into this fray, no matter what I do, I'm going to get tomatoes thrown at me. You know, it's, uh, it's such a controversial field. Translation, as I said, it's the, the tr translator, traitor, you know, it evokes, you, you're going to lose no matter what you do. There's no right way to translate anything. Um, so I, I know that when the standard edition comes out later this year, I'm going to be attacked. Uh, and I know that if I had decided I was going to change Strachey's vocabulary and make a nice everyday descriptive retarded vocabulary instead, that I would have been attacked by the other side. So no matter what I do, I know I'm going to be attacked. I'm just trying to explain to you why I did what I did. Um, the, the main reason why I did not uh, drop Strachey's technical vocabulary is because on the basis of how you conventionally do scientific writing in English, you use Latinate and, and you use terms derived from these ancient languages. That's the way that we do scientific technical vocabulary in science. Um, and Freud saw psychology as a science. He saw psychoanalysis as a science. I gave you just 
two or three quotes, but there are millions of quotations I could give you where Freud says clearly as a bell that his image of psychoanalysis is that it's a natural science of the mind. Uh, so if Freud saw himself as doing science, uh, then uh, he, if you're translating him into English, you have to use the conventions of English scientific writing. And I used the parallel example of English uh, and German neuroanatomy, which was the example that was most familiar to Freud. And uh, I, 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 it's on that basis that I decided I'm going to retain Strachey's vocabulary. There were other reasons too, but that was, in truth, the main one. Uh, if I say that there were other reasons too, I'll mention just one other one, which I've sort of hinted at already when I mentioned the fact that the word empathy has now become familiar um, in the English language. It's that these terms are familiar in psychoanalysis now. It would be really quite a, a, um, a momentous thing to do. I, I think it would be, a, a, actually I think it would be a, a big step backwards for us to start all over again with a new technical vocabulary um, you know, after, uh, what is it, 120 years of psychoanalysis, suddenly we change all the technical terms that we've been using for a century um, and, and, and start with new ones. I, I just don't think it will catch on. I just don't think people will. And psychoanalysis has been through its heyday when the, the language, the technical vocabulary of psychoanalysis, to the extent that it has penetrated into general usage. It's not, it's not going to change now. Um, we, we can't uh, and, and we shouldn't. Uh, for the reasons that I've said. And remember also that Strachey's choices and the choices of Strachey's predecessors were personally supervised by Freud and that Freud translated in that sort of way himself. So I'm ready for the tomatoes, but that's the decision that I made. Now, now I want to discuss just two examples uh, of something a little bit more complicated. Um, and then I'll make my last point, which bridges to this afternoon's talk. Um, when I say that I decided to stick with Strachey's technical vocabulary, um, that doesn't mean that in every single instance um, I've just stuck with the way Strachey did it. There are some more interesting cases, and I want to use these two examples. Here's one, Nachträglichkeit. This is a very interesting concept uh, in Freud, and it's a concept, by the way, if I may just mention briefly something uh, uh, that again alludes to this afternoon's presentation. It's a concept which was invented by Freud, but which really has acquired a whole new lease of life in cognitive neuroscience today. It's a very interesting concept. It's a concept about how memories are revised and revised and revised. They don't just get encoded in one form, that, they, that they, they're living things that alter over the passage of time. Uh, nowadays, we speak of reconsolidation. I don't know if I'll go into that this afternoon, but I thought I would just mention it. The point is Freud invented this word uh, for, this, for this concept that he discovered. He discovered that a child, a prepubertal child, will lay down a sexual experience in one form, and then after puberty, the memory is retrospectively altered. It now has a new, different meaning. It has a different causal capacity. It does different things in the mind from what it did when it was laid down the first time. Uh, how do you translate this, this word into English? I, I told you in German you were allowed to do this, what Freud did here, just banging words together. In English, that means afterwardsness. You can't speak of afterwardsness in English. There's no such thing, but that's what it means. There is no English term for that. Now, I suspect Strachey would have come up with a Latin or Greek term had he realized when he started his translation that this was an important technical concept. It was actually only under the influence of Lacan, uh, the, 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 the French um, uh, theoretical term, that they started to recognize the importance of Nachträglichkeit uh, as a technical term. So Strachey had been translating it about all sorts of words up until halfway through his translation. Um, he translated it as afterwards, retroactively, retrospectively, uh, in a retrospective fashion, and so on. And then suddenly he came up with a technical term called deferred action. And so half of his usage is deferred action, uh, and other half of his usage is all these other words. What I did in this case, rather than invent a new Greek or Latin word retrospectively, if you'll excuse that pun, um, and uh, I, I, what I did instead was every time Freud uses this word and its cognates, uh, I put it in square brackets, the original German word. Because there are places where Freud is literally just saying afterwards, that this happened afterwards, or this happened retrospectively, or this happened uh, in a deferred fashion, and so on. 
it would be a clumsy English to speak of afterwardsness, and also you would have to make clear that all of these other words, nachträgliche, nachträgliche, nachträglichkeit, and so on, all of these are part of the same concept. So what I've done in those cases is, after each of these multiple different English words um, that's uh, in the translation, I've put in square brackets the German so that you see this refers to this concept. This is, this is a technical term as well as being uh, um, whatever it is in, in and of itself uh, in, in that one place. By the way, the, I'm using that as one example. The same applies to several other concepts. And, and interestingly, uh, perhaps most interestingly in light of what I'm going to say next, um, the same applies to Übersetzung. Übersetzung means translation. And Freud uses the term all over the place in a very specific technical sense. And I think that that also, uh, I hope that in my translation it will become more apparent what an extremely important technical term in psychoanalysis translation is. I'll come back to that. Um, so I'm just giving you examples of more complex instances, okay? So I said uh, the, the, the concept of afterwardsness I've spoken of. Here's another term, trib. Here, in case you all think that I'm just an apologist for Strachey, here Strachey made what in English we call a cock-up. You know, a trib, he translated it as instinct, and that's just a mistake. You know, in, in, in German the word trib has an English equivalent, it's drive. There's no question about it. It's a technical term, it's a biological term. We've got one in English, um, everyone knows it. Uh, in fact, here in America, people use it all the time, even though Strachey translated trieb as instinct. There's a German word for instinct. It is instinct. You know, it's, uh, so for Strachey to translate trieb as instinct is, is, is just, as I say, nothing other than an error. I, I think it's because Strachey didn't know biology that he used the word uh, uh, instinct where, 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 where Freud used trieb. So there, I had no hesitation in changing it, and now uh, I'm translating trieb as drive. Uh, partly, mark, me, mark my words, uh, remember what I said earlier, I chose to, ch to retain the old technical vocabulary in most instances, partly because we are now familiar with it. But the word instinct, we're also familiar with the word drive, and so I don't think the problem applies so much to change that term now. Um, it really is misleading to translate trib as instinct. It, it means something quite different um, in biology. Um, so that's, again, just an example of some places I have changed the technical vocabulary. Some places I've had, res had recourse to square brackets to make sure that we understand that there's a continuity in the technical usage. But in most cases, I've stuck with Strachey's vocabulary, and I've told you why. Now, in my last... Six minutes, seven. Oh, oh, great. You see, wow, so it was all a fantasy. Thank you. Now let me move on then. Another, another quote from Freud. I'll read it to you in a second, but before I read it to you, I want to make this point. We, this question of our technical vocabulary we're all fussing over, you know, should we use the word like this or should we use the word like that and so on. I think there's a little bit of a problem uh, in psychoanalysis in general, which I want to um, preface the problem by reading you this thing from Freud. Freud says, w um, this is in the unconscious, he says, when we think in abstractions, there's a danger that we may neglect the relations of words to unconscious thing presentations. And it must be confessed that the expression and content of our philosophizing, he might have said theorizing, then begins to acquire an unwelcome resemblance to the mode of operation of schizophrenics. What, what Freud's talking about here is the overvaluation of words and the treating of words as if they were things in themselves. There is a great danger in that. And this leads to this problem in psychoanalysis today. I've just quoted Freud. I'd now like to quote somebody called Solms. He wrote the following, psychoanalysis is not important, it's about something important. Psychoanalysis is not about itself, it's about a part of nature called the mind, a subject matter it shares with other disciplines. So this question of our terminology, I've spoken about the, the, the continuities with 
the, with the traditions that preceded psychoanalysis. I've spoken about the disciplines that Freud was trained in before he invented psychoanalysis and the language and the con conventions of technical vocabularies that he drew upon uh, in establishing psychoanalysis. What all of this refers to is the fact that psychoanalysis is not an island. Psychoanalysis is not something that just arose sui generis uh, in the mind of Freud uh, suddenly in the, at the turn of the century. It's something that is built upon long-standing traditions. It's something which remains part of other traditions, parallel traditions, also studying the subject matter of psychoanalysis, which is something outside of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis's vocabulary is about something in nature called the mind. Psychoanalysis's vocabulary is not about psychoanalysis. And I think that there is a danger when we navel gaze too much about our technical vocabulary and fight with each other about these things, that we forget that these words are uh, not things in themselves, that these words are vehicles for communication amongst each other, ourselves, and amongst ourselves and other disciplines, studying the same thing, that when we use this word, we're talking about that thing over there. And I don't think that we do ourselves any favors by uh, coming up with strange, idiosyncratic um, ways of speaking as, uh, that, that distance psychoanalysis from the other mental sciences, including from the philosophy of mind. Here is a long quote. <laughs> the, reason, the reason that I ha have this long quote, which I'm going to read to you uh, on the screen, is because I think that this points to the heart of the matter uh, and also makes the link to what we're going to talk about after lunch. Um, my claim here, and this is Freud uh, who I'm, I'm going to read to you, but my claim based on what Freud says here is that psychoanalysis itself is a form of translation. Psychoanalysis is a translating exercise. Strachey writes, uh, Freud writes, oops, Strachey writes, behind the attributes or qualities of the object under examination, which are presented directly to our perception, we in psychoanalysis have to discover something else which is more independent of the particular receptive capacity of our sense organs and which approximates more closely to what may be supposed to be the real state of affairs. We have no hope of being able to reach the latter, that is to say the real state of affairs itself, since it is evident that everything new that we have inferred must nevertheless be translated back into the language of our perceptions from which it is simply impossible to free ourselves. But herein lies the very nature and limitation of our science. It is as though we were to say in physics, if we could see clearly enough, we should find that what appears to be a solid body is made up of particles of such and such shape and size occupying such and such relative positions. In the meantime, we try to increase the efficiency of our sense organs to the furthest possible extent by artificial aids but it may be expected that all such efforts will fail to affect the ultimate outcome. Reality in itself will always remain unknowable. The yield brought to light by scientific work from our primary sense perceptions will consist in an insight into connections and dependent relations which are present in the external world, which can somehow be reliably reproduced and reflected in the internal world of our thought and the knowledge of which enables us to understand something in the external world, to foresee it and possibly to alter it. Our procedure in psychoanalysis is quite similar. We have discovered technical methods of filling up the gaps in the phenomena of our consciousness, and we make use of those methods just as a physicist makes use of experiment. In this manner, we infer a number of processes which are in themselves unknowable and interpolate them into those that are conscious to us. And if, for instance, we say, at this point an unconscious memory intervened, what we mean is, at this point something occurred of which we are totally unable to form a conception, but which if it had entered consciousness could only have been described in such and such a way. This cannot be affected without framing fresh hypotheses and creating fresh concepts, but these are not to be despised as evidence of embarrassment on our part but deserve, on the contrary, to be appreciated as an enrichment of science. That's Freud in his outline of psychoanalysis, his last will and testament. Um, a beautiful, beautiful essay summarizing his life's work. And there I think he says something utterly profound, 
about the, the, the thing that we are talking about this morning. That psychoanalysis is a science of translation, where we are trying to translate, just as all sciences do, we're not just looking at the surface. In other words, in, our, in the case of psychoanalysis, we're not just looking at subjective experience. We're not mere phenomenologists. We're saying, what lies behind these phenomena? We're trying to infer the causal mechanisms. What is it that's really going on that looks like this to the senses? And he says, in this, we're like physicists. Please note, this is the Freud that we're supposed to be falsely scientizing. Freud says, in this we are like physicists, where physicists look to the external world and they say, you see this solid thing? Actually, it's not really a solid thing. You know, that's a crude kind of phenomenal description. Behind that, there are particles and these invisible forces interacting with each other in such and such a way. That is the real nature of the physical. And Freud says, psychoanalysis does the same in relation to the psychical. We say, behind this surface of conscious subjective experience, they lie real, a reality which we can't see, which is not consciously perceivable. We infer it, and he says we use a method, much like physicists use experiment, we use the method of free association in order to try and infer what lies behind these surface phenomena, these dreams, these fantasies, these slips of the tongue, these symptoms, and so on. What, are the re what is the real state of affairs? And in order to be able to describe that real state of affairs, we have to translate it into a language into a language of a figurative language, things that we can see, things that we can picture. Uh, and in doing so, we're doing violence to the things in themselves. They are not the words, they are not the translation. They are something unknowable, which we translate into a language that we can use to communicate about it. And uh, what is especially important in psychoanalysis, as opposed to physics, is that these things are forevermore invisible. It's in the nature of the mind that it is not a thing. It's not an object. You can never touch it. You can never see it. You can never taste it or smell it, uh, even if you wanted to. It's, it's something intrinsically subjective, intrinsically non-visualizable and, and, and non-tangible. And uh, therefore, I think that there is a great danger in us um, uh, losing sight uh, of the achievement of us having a technical vocabulary at all. As Freud said in the earlier quote, and remember I underlined that sentence and I said I'm going to, I'm underlining it because I want to come back to it. Freud said if we did not create words for these things, we could not think them at all. Uh, and these things that I'm talking about are the things that we have discovered about the nature of the mind in psychoanalysis. This is what our technical vocabulary is for. What on earth is going to be achieved by us creating a babel of different terms for these things which we can't even see? I mean, at least in biology, we can say, you know, you can call it a Neanderthal, I'm going to call it a such and such, but that's the thing. You know, you can point to the bone and say, that's the anatomy I'm speaking, this is the phenotype I'm speaking about, this is the particle I'm speaking about, this is the blah, 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 the things in physical science. In mental science, there are no things. That's the nature of the mental. And so for us to cre create a cacophony of different words for the same thing is really going to undermine what is already a bloody difficult task. And I think that it's a precious heritage that we've got agreed upon terms. This is what the glossary committee was all about. This, by the way, is what a standard edition is about. It's to have a standard translation, a standard vocabulary. <coughs> there is, if you'll forgive me, I know I'm being filmed, there is a sort of a twit in England named Adam Phillips. And uh, he, he edited uh, this Penguin uh, a new translation of Freud, where every volume is translated by a different person. Each one uses their own vocabulary, all of them ordinary, everyday descriptive terms, none of them the same as each other. Nobody knows who's talking about what. You know, who, what is this? And what is worse is none of them is an expert in psychoanalysis. So they don't even know what they're writing about. No wonder they find it okay to just make up words as they go along. Because they don't know that Freud comes from this particular tradition, that this is a body of knowledge, you know, which is built upon other bod bodies of knowledge which have developed in parallel with ours. And um, to me, this is a massively destructive step in the translation of Freud, to create a Babel. Uh, and, and again, I say to you, let us not forget that these words are about things. Uh, they're not about themselves. This is not an exercise in literary criticism. This is an attempt to develop an understanding 
uh, of this part of nature called the human mind, and it deserves the, the same dignity and the same seriousness as the study of any other part of nature. That said, in my closing sentence, I want to point out that there have been other metapsychologies. Freud, of course, isn't the beginning and end of psychoanalysis. Freud would be horrified if, he, if we had lionized him, uh, which we have. Uh, Freud would be horrified to know how we have lionized him, how many people don't ever want to see any progress in psychoanalysis, how many people see Freud's word as the word uh, and treat um, the Freudian canon as, uh, as a Talmudic uh, exercise. You know. um, Psychoanalysis has developed, there are theories that have developed beyond Freud's, um, and ne necessarily there are vocabularies that have come with those new theories, building upon the old vocabulary and the old theories. This is the way that it's done in science. We should expect nothing different. And uh, I want to point out that each new theory, Freudian metapsychology has become kind of old-fashioned. It's become kind of arcane, archaic, um, historical exercise studying Freudian metapsychology. But I want to point out that Freudian metapsychology is not the only metapsychology. Although we don't use the word metapsychology for anything other than Freudian metapsychology, really you can't have a psychoanalysis without a metapsychology. What metapsychology is, what the word means, is exactly what I was describing to you earlier when I said that in psychoanalysis we have to make a translation from the phenomenal surface, we have to infer what lies behind it, what is meta-psychological, what is behind the conscious experiences, and theorize about it, and we've got to find some sort of language to capture, some sort of figurative language, to capture those intrinsically unknowable, unperceivable things in the unconscious mind, which is, after all, the, the, the primary subject matter of psychoanalysis. And so, for example, the language of Melanie Klein, which is the one that I was most um, trained in after Freud, because I trained in the British society. The language of Melanie Klein, although it's not called a metapsychology, is a metapsychology. Her language of unconscious fantasy is just another metapsychology. It's another way of translating, another way of trying to find a language to describe what's going on in the inner workings of our minds. Um, and this. Uh, uh, language of unconscious fantasy, unlike the language of Freud, is a first-person metapsychology. It describes the unconscious as if it were made up of a drama of characters on a stage. And it's not only Melanie Klein who does this. Um, Herbert Rosenfeld, who was a great follower of Melanie Klein, I don't know if, if, if he's well known uh, in these parts, but he spoke, for example, of what Freud called the death drive. Um, for, for Rosenfeld, this was a mafiosi gang you know, people sort of like trying to sell you heroin and saying, hey, come on, it's like a chill out, man, life's a beach. And he describes, you know, these characters uh, in unconscious fantasy trying to seduce you into, into sort of like short-circuiting and tricking reality. That's a wonderful language. It's a metapsychology, though. That's what it is. So I'm not saying that we must have only one metapsychology. We must always stick with Freudian metapsychology. We must never, 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 never. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that when we're translating Freud, uh, you know, we should do justice to the Freudian canon. And to do justice to the Freudian discipline of psychoanalysis, we must develop it. And that doesn't mean we must just stick with, what's, with, what, with what Freud left us in 1939. And uh, that's the bridge to what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon when I talk about the translation of psychoanalysis into neuroscientific terms. Thanks very much. So, a few words on uh, process. Uh, we're going to uh, have about 10-15 uh, minutes uh, for questions at this point, up until 11.40. At uh, 11.40, we'll have a bit of discussion. Uh, Eric Gann, whom I'll introduce uh, at that point, will uh, be the, uh, will respond to uh, what Mark has said. Margaret and I will also have some comments. Uh, and then let's see, at uh, 12 o'clock, there'll be uh, time for some additional uh, questions and uh, discussion from the floor and from all of us. Uh, and about, for about another 10 minutes, 
then uh, Margaret uh, will uh, give a kind of a wrap up of the morning and also talk a little bit about how to obtain lunch. And at 12.15, we'll uh, break for lunch and reconvene it uh, at 1.30. So uh, right now, we've got about 10, 15 minutes uh, for discussion uh, before I introduce uh, uh, questions and discussion before I introduce Eric. There's so somebody on the, oh, has a microphone. There, there you are. Thank you very much. Eric uh, re reminds us to please be sure to talk into the microphone so your question is recorded. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm Joe Caston. I'm sure you'll helpfully correct me on this, but there's the famous quote from Freud that where id was, there shall ego be. And my understanding about the original German, and I don't remember where I got this from, maybe it's from the uh, La Planche Pontalise Dictionary. There he doesn't say das ich, but he says ich. In other words, in which would imply that instead of the ego apparatus will be there where the id was, but rather I, who am an agent, shall be, which gives a very different connotation. And I don't know if you can help me with that. Yes. Um, so yes, you're right that uh, this is the um, uh, a particular sentence or phrase that uh, Laplanche and Pontalis uh, comment on. Uh, uh, it was wo es war sollte ich bekommen, where, and straightly translates it as, where it was, there shall ego be. Um, and uh, part of their point, Laplanche and Pontalis's, is that it's not there shall ego be, but rather there shall ego become uh, common. But um, I don't really see, to be honest with you, what all the fuss is about there. Because first of all, Strachey does not say where the id was, there shall the ego be. He says where id was, there shall ego be. So the, 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 the the isn't in Strachey's translation. Nevertheless, I think it's also perfectly clear that Freud is referring to those concepts of das ich und das es in that, in that phrase. Freud was not um, uh, averse to poetic phraseology. Uh, that's a very beautiful phrase. And Freud didn't win the Goethe Prize for nothing. And I think that it sounds more beautiful to say, you know, where it was, there shall ego be. Uh, it's, it's meant to be as an aphorism. And, and I think that the English translation conveys that very well. Um, the, the concept of the third person's thing called the, the ego, and the id, I think, applies there, despite the way in which the words are used. I don't think that it has a different reference. That said, it is also certainly the case that Freud's usage of the word ish is not always referring to the structural conception of the ish. And I think that that's part of the, um, uh, the, the, part of the beauty of the concept is that it has this nuancing and uh, that there's a sort of finding away from the third person abstract that part of nature uh, which has this executive function in this thing called the mind um, finds a way into this thing that I experience myself to be. I think that that's, uh, that, that, that the, the, the usage um, in the German allows for that nuancing in a way that uh, in the English it doesn't. Um, that said, what, how Strachey manages it, and I've done the same, is that sometimes we speak of the ego, sometimes we speak of ego, and sometimes we speak of I. And uh, unfortunately, there's a change of word. Uh, and as I said, there really is no two ways about it uh, in translation. You know, you either do it the one way or you do it the other. Something is lost either way because no two languages are the same. The German-ish can be nuanced in that, in that range of ways in which um, the technical term in English, the ego, uh, cannot. Uh, but to use the word, the colloquial word I, 
in that technical context is equally weird. You know, so that's why I'm saying something has to be lost either way. Uh, there are places where Freud frankly speaks of I, you know, I think this uh, at the one extreme, and he uses the very same word ish there that he uses when he speaks in um, the ego and the id about this, this province of the mind that he's describing. So to sum up, I've never understood why Laplanche and Pontelis made such a thing of that particular phrase, um, but I do grant that there is something lost by translating ish as ego. I think on balance, more is gained by retaining the technical term which has hundreds of years of history. Uh, the word that Freud used in that technical sense has always been translated as the ego. And to, to detach Freud from that long tradition in translation, I think does more harm than what we lose um, by not being able to have this nice... This. Now, I want to tell you, uh, since you've asked that question, I want to use it as a platform for saying two more general things. Um, the one is that um, although I've retained Strachey's vocabulary, uh, and indeed I've retained Strachey's base translations, all that I've done is revised the translations, I've compared them to the German text and corrected them. Where Strachey made errors, I correct them. By the way, Strachey made lots of errors, not least because he was going blind when he did the standard edition. And I, I mean, that's sort of funny in one way. In another way, it's not so funny because I'm now going blind after 20 fucking years of doing this translation. <laughs> You know, and I now know what it's like. It's bloody excruciating, you know, when you can't even see the text anymore and you're a translator, you know, it's sort of horrifying. Um, but for that reason, I mean, let's not be personal about it. For that reason, Strachey made lots of mistakes. And it's also very interesting. The mistakes that he made are not always unmotivated. There's certain themes that he makes mistakes with more often than others. You know, he just doesn't see something that Freud wrote. Often about the mother-baby relationship. Very interestingly, you know, uh, it says something about Strachey. Uh, but in any event, to come back to the point where, where uh, Strachey has made an error, I correct it. But in instances like the one you refer to, where Strachey wrote uh, where it was there shall ego be, and uh, Laplanche and Pontelis, and before them uh, 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 Jean Flecon had so much to say about it, what I've done in those cases is I've made a little superscript note. Uh, I say superscript note uh, because it's not a footnote. I don't want to clutter the text with endless discussions of the translation. I mean, only a few weird people like me are interested in these matters. Um, what I've done is a little superscript end note uh, to the 24th volume, where each and every instance of a controversial translation, of where there are different opinions about how this sentence should have been translated, I make the reader aware that these are other these are alternative renditions, even in that dreadful um, Adam Phillips uh, uh, translation, you know, where they've commented in their idiocy on the way that Strachey translated things, I reproduce their idiotic comments uh, in the 24th <laughs> volume. Um, that's, so, so where there's an error, I correct it. Where it's a significant error, I correct it and make a note saying, hey, here Strachey said this, and actually Freud said that, that was a mistake. Um, if it's a, a, a nonsense, I mean, you can't have too many of those notes also, there are too many, but where, where there's something worth saying about the error, I, I make the reader aware of it. And where it's controversial as opposed to erroneous, there I make an end note. Um, and that's different from the technical terms. I mean, that's a particular phrase which appears once in one particular place in the Ego and the, 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 um, the technical terms which occur throughout Freud's writing uh, there I've made a glossary of those terms. And for each one of those technical terms, including all of the ones that I had up on the screen today, plus many, many more, um, what I've done is made the reader aware, again in the 24th volume, that this is Freud's word, this is its denotation, connotation in German, this is Strachey's word, this is what's lost in translation. And this is the history of the controversy, sorry, this is the history of the usage of this term. Who used it first? Because most of the times it's not stretchy. And did Freud approve of it or not? And quoting what Freud said about the English term. And then going into the history of Strachey's usage and then into all the alternative renditions that have been offered uh, by, um, by other, uh, by, in the secondary literature. So again, the reader is informed about all of this controversy. Because as I said, there is no perfect way to translate. There's always going to be controversy. And I thought the best that we can do is make the reader aware that this controversy exists. Uh, there's no way that you're going to be able to uh, 
translated to where. I think we have Thanks. time for another one more question. This is the problem with me and questions. <laughs> but please note we have lots of time for further questions, um, uh, uh, if I heard Chuck correctly. I, I, sorry, where are you? Ah, hi, yes, I see you. Yep. I, I have a basic question. I'm wondering if psychoanalysis isn't neurology and neuroscience in a different language. I, I, I think it's basically psychoanalysis for me is basically starts with biology and neurology and neuroscience and then it's uh, applied in a different language and in a more abstract way, but it's a direct transition from neurology and neuroscience. Well, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I have up on the screen the title of this afternoon's presentation. <laughs> Here is Freud in 1898. Freud said that psychoanalysis was born in 1895 or 1900 or somewhere in between. Okay, that's a direct quote. And uh, that, that's in his autobiographical study. Uh, here he's writing in 1898, somewhere in that window, and he's writing to his friend Fleece. And this is what he says. I am not at all inclined to leave my psychology hanging in the air without an organic basis. But apart from this conviction, I do not know how to go on neither theoretically nor therapeutically, and therefore I must behave as if only the psychological were under consideration. And I think that speaks directly to your point, that Freud, um, between the project of 1895 and the interpretation of dreams of 1900, realized that if we're going to have a science of the mind, uh, that is to say, a natural science of the mind, which is what he clearly, self-evidently, and explicitly was aspiring to. A, a science means an empirical discipline, a discipline in which you can make observations, and on the basis of those observations, that is to say, empirical observations, you, you make deductions and you formulate hypotheses, then you test those hypotheses against further observations. That's how science works, and you either confirm or correct your hypothesis, and this is how you develop your theoretical models. Freud recognized sometime during those five years, uh, marked, as I say, by, uh, or bookended by the project for a scientific psychology of 1895 and the interpretation of dreams of 1900. He realized somewhere in that window that in order to have a science of the mind, we have to abandon neuroanatomy and neurophysiology for the present. That was the exact word that he used, by the way, for the present. And that's what he's saying here, too, at the time that he actually did it. He said that we must behave as if we only are dealing with psychological phenomena, even though we know that behind them there are biological phenomena. And the reason that he did that was precisely because he wanted to establish a science of the mind. During that period of time, what Freud had to acknowledge, what he had to painfully recognize, was that we did not have methods in neuroscience to be able to visualize these dynamic mental processes that he was discovering clinically. So Freud was discovering clinically that there were things like unconscious memories. There were things like repressed unconscious memories. There were things like resistances to the remembering of unconscious repressed material and so on. And in his project of 1895, he tried to describe these mechanisms in literally in anatomical, neuronal, and neurophysiological terms. And what he had to recognize in his attempt to do that was that he was, and I'll quote here Freud again, sadly this is one of the tragedies of being a person like me is you end up remembering all this stuff <laughs> verbatim. Uh, Freud, said, Freud said to Fleece at the time, my method, and he's describing the method that he used in writing the project. He said, my method, and this is Freud the scientist speaking, my method was one of imaginings, transpositions, and guesses. Okay? So what self-respecting scientist wants to use that method? Mm -hmm. And that's what Freud had to recognize in 1896. He recognized it, that in making this construction in the project, where he was trying to translate what he had inferred from psychological observations, trying to translate them into neuroanatomical and neurophysiological terms, he was guessing. 
because there was no possibility of making observations upon the anatomical and physiological material because we had no methods at that time. And that's why Freud said, for the present, we must behave as if you know, only the psychological exists. And this was a promissory note. Uh, and he said it later, uh, that, that, that one day, it, and, and this is what these other quotes which I'll show you after lunch show, one day it will become possible to make observations on the neural substratum. And then, of course, we will do that in order to um, uh, use all the help we can get in trying to discern how this part of nature works. That is genuinely a superego this time. <laughs> And an admirer. <laughs> uh, so we'll have more time for questions, and, and, but I, I do want to introduce uh, Eric Gann, uh, who is uh, going to talk first, and then Margaret and I may say a few words. Uh, Eric is the uh, chair of the Psychoanalytic Scholarship Forum of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He's a training and supervising analyst at the San Francisco Center for Psychoanalysis. And he is a principal in the Boswell Group uh, and in private practice in uh, San Francisco. Eric has also been a colleague and friend since our psychiatry residency together at uh, Mount Zion Hospital quite a few years ago. Uh, and I, I must say it's there, uh, I don't think we first learned the words there, but that's really where I cathected the word cathexis. And boy, did, 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 did we cathect, except when we decathected and fell asleep during lectures and so forth. Uh, and the, the other thing, there was a particular word that our residency group seemed to have uh, cathected, and that is the word vicissitudes. So we would have vicissitudes about what time are you going for coffee? It was, you know, it was, you know, and, and these words are now our, our native language. Uh, Eric is also an especially creative thinker, and we're uh, privileged to have him here today. Thank you, Chuck. Um, in order to promote your cathecting, my comments, the vicissitudes of which will become apparent momentarily, or should I say, in order to promote your occupying or sitting on my comments, <laughs> I'd like to reassure you that I do not have a written discussion either. Uh, like Mark, I did do a little planning, uh, and I would like to make a few points uh, in responding to his presentation that will bear both on this morning's um, presentation as well as this afternoon, as I think you'll see in a minute. But I would like to start by telling you two stories. The first story uh, is about what happened to me this morning. And it has to do with my relationship in part to the standard edition. So uh, I recovered a memory this morning. And it's striking that it should happen this morning. Um, and it goes as follows. Um, my analyst when I was in candidate training back in the 1970s, the late Herbert Lehman was a German Jewish immigrant. And it turns out that Dr. Lehman was, had a particular interest in Freud and Freud's work and wrote papers about Freud and Freud's work. And uh, I assumed when I learned this later on um, in my own development that he had read Freud in his own native German as well as English in the Strachey translation. All right, so as it turns out, uh, as my own career developed and my, uh, my interests were of teaching Freud, and it turns out that in the 40 years or so of my teaching career, I have mostly, the vast, uh, the vast majority of it has been in teaching Freud from the standard edition. Some years after I graduated, uh, I became aware of the controversial comments that Mark referred to that were being made about Strachey's translation. The Bettelheim uh, book had come out and uh, there were other commentaries that then increased and I became quite concerned about this. I ran into my former analyst at a meeting some years after and I said to him, do you think 
I need to learn German and read the standard edition in German to really grasp what's going on. And uh, much to my relief, but also to my perplexity, he said, no, that you don't need to do that. You're doing just fine. So I have continued over the decades in this fashion, using the Strachey translation, hoping that someday there would be some clarification about this. And all I want to say, and I want to take this opportunity to say to Mark Solms, what took you so long? I've been waiting for 40 years for this. <laughs> all right, so let me tell you another story. And since I know that uh, probably um, uh, many of you are clinicians, I'm going to bring a uh, story about translation into the consulting room for just a moment to make a point, and then I want to make a couple of points about uh, language and how it bears on translation. Um, and then I want to end by posing a very specific question of a translation of a particular uh, term to Mark as an illustration of some of the difficulties that one has in doing this kind of work. So I want to tell you about the following clinical um, situation that I was in many years ago. Uh, a young woman from France uh, was referred to me uh, for consultation. And she came um, with uh, complaining of some problems in her marriage. She had met, she had come to the United States to study in her particular field, and she had met a man here from Brazil. So he spoke Portuguese and English. They met here in the States, and of course, they met each other speaking English. She learned Portuguese, and she told me that she uh, was hoping to get into treatment to get some help because of problems that she was experiencing in the intimate aspects of their relationship, and particularly in their sexual uh, relations, where she felt there were certain uh, pronounced inhibitions. It turned out, she told me, that, um, and they had a child by this point when she came to see me, and um, she said that she and her husband spoke to each other mostly in Portuguese and English. They spoke English to the child who was now being raised in the United States, but she could not speak to him in French. There was something that just felt too charged and intimate about it. Now, I noted that she spoke English quite well uh, with a very heavy French accent, which I found rather charming. Uh, but as I thought at the end of the consultation what I would propose to her, I gave some thought to the following uh, idea. I felt that even though it turned out I speak French fairly fluently, I felt uncomfortable with the idea of seeing her in French, which was her native language, because I feel that for me, it's difficult enough to understand what people are saying in my own native language. So, and the nuances and subtleties. So uh, I proposed to her I would be very happy to refer her to a native French-speaking therapist, um, which she uh, thought about, and then she said to me that uh, she did not want that. She wanted to continue with me in English. Okay, so I thought we'll give it a try. So we started meeting face to face twice a week and we went along and things were going quite well, I thought. She was uh, getting very attached uh, in the treatment and one of the um, prominent features of what came out was that in the transference she was regarding me as being quite superior and dominant to her and she related it to the fact that I was speaking in my native language and she was not. At least that was one expression of it. Okay, so we're going along just fine. And a number of months, maybe six, seven, eight months into the treatment, it dawned on me one day that she had not ever presented a dream to me. And I, uh, which is something that I make clear to patients when I introduce them to how we'll work together, that this is something that I'm interested in utilizing. So I brought this up with her, and she said to me, oh, I dream every night. So I said, well, that's interesting. We, we should use it, so please feel free. So in the, in the next session, of course, she came in, and she presented a dream. And she started telling me the dream, and as soon as she started, I interrupted her, and I said, wait a second. 
you dream in French, don't you? And she said, of course, I dream in French. And then I thought to myself, wait a second, how are we going to work with this? Because if you're going to associate to a dream you're translating into English for me, and you're going to associate in English, this is not going to fly. Because, for example, uh, in French, you take the word la mère, which M-E-R is the mother, I'm sorry, is the C. M-E accent grave R-E, la mère is the mother. Obviously, if she were to have a dream about the ocean or the sea, in French, la mère would be an associative link that we would naturally See, however, in English, if she told me I dreamt about the ocean, we would never get to that easily. So I made a proposal to her just for the sake of telling you the story that from now on, when she was going to present a dream, she would present it in French. I would ask her if there were any details I couldn't follow. And then she should associate in French. And then at whatever point organically uh, that we would find ourselves, we would shift back into English. Well, you know what happened. The rest of the treatment was in French. And the transference suddenly shifted dramatically. Now she was the dominant one, and I was the weak one. Now, I don't want to get into discussing the case. That's a whole other matter, even though I'm sure you have thoughts uh, about that. Um, the point was, this really made a big impact on me in terms of language and the structure of language and the impact of the structure of language. So I'd like to say a few, a few points about language, its structure and form. And I'm not going to be at all exhaustive in what I'm going to say. I want to, I want to make a couple of points that are important to me in terms of what we're discussing today. So, three points. One, I want to um, think of language as a mode of representation that is serving a symbolic function and giving form to our mentation. And by mentation, I mean more than just our cognitive thoughts. Second, language as a mode of communication, which obviously is the key to uh, interaction in interpersonal and relational functions. And third, language as a manifestation of complex psychophysical social processes that are experienced as a description of subjectivity. Now, adults use language to convey their conscious experience to themselves and to other living things but a couple of points here. First, about the third, uh, I, the third proposition. I regard speaking not just as an act of communicating to myself and others, but every nanosecond of existence, it is a representation of experience involving conscious and unconscious reference cortical and subcortical discharges and activations, associations that are linguistic and also in other modes of perceptual representation, visual, auditory, so forth, so on, and concomitant physiological processes affecting all neuronal, humoral, meaning bloodborne, endocrine systems, and all bodily organs. Every act of speaking is a complex psychological, physical act down to every organ in the body. So I no longer think in terms of states of mind, something that's very current in our discourse today. I think now only in terms of states of body mind. Maybe that'll have a bearing on what we're discussing later. And by the way, in terms of translating, um, the, when, we tra when we're translating, and uh, one of the four questions um, that Chuck has distributed to you, 
uh, are we translating inner thoughts when we speak? I say, absolutely yes, and a lot more. And by the way, I think Freud implied and meant exactly the same conclusion if you read chapter section, section F in the beginning paragraphs when he talks about making the unconscious conscious, I think he's coming to very much the same conclusion. We can talk about that later. Regarding one, language is a system of representation. I want to say that it's obvious to us that it is structured differently and shaped by different socio-cultural and other contextual forces. And this poses tremendous challenges in translation. Consider for a second that in the Eskimo Inuit languages, there are dozens of words for different states of ice. Or in the Navajo language, there are dozens of words for different states of water. How do you translate those kinds of things into English? An example taken from uh, my own experience, we were traveling in China a number of years ago, and um, uh, in fact, we were lecturing on psychoanalysis to uh, groups that were interested in learning about um, psychoanalytic thinking. And at one point, our host took us to a particular garden at, uh, at the major university there. And uh, he pointed to the sign that was the name of the garden. And in the Chinese uh, language, the, the characters, he showed us that the character that was the name, representing the name for the garden, was composed of a part of a character indicating sky, a character indicating grass, and a character indicating bushes. And it made me think, the Chinese language, as it's represented, is structured completely differently from the kind of Indo-European uh, 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 you know, symbolic representations that we use in our written form. And so it's a much more picto pictographic, visual kind of symbolic representation than the more purely abstract uh, representations that we have in our language. Again, uh, language is structured so differently. So, language in the individual. We make words, and when we speak and use words consciously, they have connotations through unique memory-derived associative links. And these have to be peculiar to each individual because each of us has a unique history and therefore each of us has a unique uh, structure of associations to what we're saying consciously, what we're thinking. So I've come to the following conclusion. No one of us is ever speaking the same language. Exactly. It's only through consensual approximations and conventional agreements that we come to understand each other and have some idea that we project about what the other person is saying, thinking, and meaning. So, if this is true in general about individuals, I would maintain that the same thing is true of written and theoretical language. And here I'd like to end by posing to Mark for just showing this kind of what he's been through. Um, one of the terms that he did not bring up in his list was the term that is central to our psychoanalytic project. Let's consider the word in English, the unconscious. Now in German, and by the way, I don't speak German, so um, I'm, I'm just piecing together little pieces that I've learned from my own uh, explorations, but in, uh, in the standard edition, Strachey points out that the German word unbewusst, did I say that correctly, is actually a form of a word that does not exist in English. I want to read you Strachey's note about this in the standard edition. He says, there's a further ambiguity in the word unconscious, quote unquote, which is scarcely present in German. The German words bewusst and unbewusst have the grammatical form of passive participles, and their usual sense is something like, quote, consciously known or not consciously known, unquote. The English conscious 
though it can be used in the same way, is also used, and perhaps more commonly, in an active sense. For instance, he was conscious of the sound, or he lay there unconscious. The German terms do not often have this active meaning, and it's important to bear in mind that, quote, conscious is in general to be understood in a passive sense in what follows. The German word Bewusstsein, on the other hand, which is here translated consciousness, does have an active sense. Thus, for instance, Freud speaks of the psychical act of, quote, uh, an act of a psychical act becoming, quote, an object of consciousness, unquote. And again, he speaks of, quote, the perception of mental processes by means of consciousness, unquote. And in general, when he uses such phrases as our consciousness, he's referring to our consciousness of something. When he wishes to speak of a mental state's consciousness in the passive sense, he uses the word bewusstheit, which is translated here the attribute of being conscious, or the fact of being conscious, or simply being conscious, where the English conscious is almost always in these papers to be taken in the passive sense. So uh, when I first learned about this problem with the word, uh, with the word unbewusst, I thought it was actually quite neat that that's how Freud expressed it in German, and I don't know if this is accurate, but I'm hoping Mark will correct me or, or tell us about his own struggle with this term, because if it is a past participle in German, I figured that it's trying to represent something that is the result of some kind of action. In other words, it connotes the process of something being made, something or put somewhere, something like that. And certainly in his topographic model, um, that would have a great deal of meaning. So, Mark, I'd like to ask you, will you enlighten us about how you dealt with this fairly important term? Thank you. So I, think, I, think, I think Margaret and I uh, will have a chance to say a word or two later. We should uh, go to Mark. So much, Eric. Uh, just tell me, for my own orientation, what's going on. Um, it's two minutes past twelve. And what, what, what time are we break? What's happening now? Twelve fifteen. So, so I must respond now to Eric. Yeah, but Margaret uh, will need to tell people how to get lunch. We don't want to okay. shortchange the afternoon, which okay. is very important. We have eleven point five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But by the way, I'm really. I must tell you. It's a very lonely business translating. You know, I've been sitting there for 20 bloody years, a little bit more, and I'm so excited, you know, that now at last this bloody thing is coming out and, and I'm able to interact with people who, who to my surprise, are interested in these, in these matters. Uh, it's really, it's, I'm really enjoying myself. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, when, when, when Eric said, what took you so long? Um, I mean, I can give you a serious answer. Um, and I can give you a less serious answer. I, I, I thought uh, I'll give you a less serious one. Before I do so, I must tell you I'm not Jewish. My wife is Jewish and my children are Jewish. So I'm sort of honorary Jewish. But my own background is anything but Jewish. It's a German aristocratic background. It's the opposite. But um, I, I'm entitled to tell Jewish jokes because of, because of my marriage. <laughs> so, you know, in, in Jerusalem, there is a special psychiatric unit which exists nowhere else in the world, especially for people who think they're the Messiah. Because people who think they're the Messiah, of course, they go to Jerusalem. And so there's a special unit there um, uh, to deal with such individuals. Now, one day, uh, another Messiah was admitted. And uh, he was examined in the usual way. And then the case conference was held. And then the, the, uh, the, the various psychiatrists who'd examined him looked at each other with a sort of a recognition, glimmer of recognition in each other's eyes that they all had the same problem. And then eventually somebody verbalized that this one really is the Messiah, isn't he? <laughs> and uh, they all said, looks like it. 
And so everyone, you know, the world has changed. The Messiah has come. So everyone has to congregate in Jerusalem. You know, this is, this is the time. So messages are sent out, and every Jew in the world returns to Jerusalem uh, because the Messiah has come. And, of course, careful records have to be kept to make sure everyone is there. And eventually, almost everyone is there, uh, except one man from Johannesburg. His, his name is Julian Stern, and he's not in Jerusalem. So a message is sent to Johannesburg, to Julian Stern, uh, will you please come to Jerusalem? We have to begin. We're all waiting only for you. So he says, well, you know, I'm very busy. I've got to close up the shop, and you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll come on Thursday. And so, okay, Thursday. So the Messiah and his, you know, all of his assembled advisors and uh, everyone uh, goes to Ben Gurion Airport uh, to receive Julian Stern from Johannesburg. And the, uh, the plane lands, and everyone decants from the plane, uh, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and eventually this short little guy comes right at the end. And you, know, you can see that he realizes they're waiting for him, and so they're sort of you know, waiting for Julian Stern, and he comes up, and the Messiah says to him, are you Julian Stern? He says, yes. He says, do you know how long we've been waiting for you? And Stern says, look who's talking. <laughs> I'm just going to go from top to bottom through the things that Eric raised. Um, at the beginning, uh, he spoke about um, his, his and, and Chuck's cathexis of the word cathexis. And uh, that made me realize that there was something I wanted to say earlier uh, that I forgot to say when I said it's translate, you know, that the ordinary meaning of the word cathexis is occupation. One of the problems in the translation of cathexis uh, as occupation is that it doesn't always translate properly as occupation. You know, there, there are some times when it has the meaning rather of an electrical charge. And Freud actually explicitly says that at one point in, for example, the neuropsychosis of defense. He says it's like an electrical charge spread over the surface of a body. This is the way he, 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 he translates Versetzung, which is not the same as the occupation of a town or the occupation of a lavatory at all. So you would also sometimes have to use the word charge. Um, and sometimes you would have to use the word investment in the economic sense, you know, and also the psychological sense. It, it's, it's not quite the same as occupation or charge. In other instances, interestingly, like for example, in the occupying of a role, if I'm playing Hamlet, I'm besetzing Hamlet, I am cast as Hamlet. So it has all of these different, you know, the word besetzung can be used in all those ways for which no one English word would do. And so, again, you know, to, to, to come up with a new word, one of the reasons why Strachey does this, and why any translator uh, of, of, a, of a new science you know, would have to do this, is because of this problem of untranslatability. And, and I think having recourse to ancient Greek and Latin from that point of view also has the advantage that precisely because these are dead languages, they don't have a particular figurative meaning. Uh, then we can, each of us, besets, as you said, the word with our own meaning uh, as we come to know it. And I think that's what's happened with our technical vocabulary in psychoanalysis. Then Eric went on to speak about his analyst and his reading of Freud in, in the English and him sort of worrying as he saw this critical literature and asking his analyst, who was from the old country, and so I thought, oh, God, yeah, we're going to have another one. You know, Eric's analyst is going to have said to him, no, it's no good, it's this. You know? And so I started preparing my, my response um, because I've heard it so often. And uh, what I've noticed, like in the case of Bettelheim, you know, these are people who are kind of nostalgic for a world that's gone, you know. And it's really quite moving in a way that they, of course, Freud in English is not their Freud. It's inevitable in translation. It happens like that. And, you know, these are people who had to leave a, a, a world that, you know, it was tragic, the circumstances, appalling their circumstances. And so to come here to America for all of its, you know, merits, it's not Vienna, you know, and it's all, and as I said to you earlier, by uns war es immer besser, but it's so much better in the old days in our place and so on. I really think that's what motivates a hell of a lot of that impassioned attack on Freud in English, you know, or Freud in America, uh, as it were. It's a kind of understandable but not rational business about the translation itself. It's something about a, a world that's gone. And uh, I, that brought another joke to my mind, which I, which I want to, which Freud, one of Freud's favorites was Karl Krauss, 
who wrote, uh, who was the editor of uh, the Tackle, it's a, a, a Viennese uh, um, uh, um, periodical. And uh, Karl Kraus said, uh, in der Vergangenheit, sogar die Zukunft war besser. In the old days, even the future was better. <laughs> <laughs> I will resist telling you the joke about um, which is the best language uh, in the interests of time, but there's a really great joke about that. <laughs> the, 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 no, I can't. <laughs> um, I, I, I really must try to be a good boy. We've got lots of time later. If I'm running out of things to say, I'll tell you that joke. The, 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 the three uh, points about, about language um, that Eric made, the, the serious points, uh, I, I can only applaud what he said, uh, what was his third point, you know, about states of body-mind. I think that um, this is very much in the spirit of what psychoanalysis is all about, what psychoanalysis must become, what psychoanalysis always aspired to be. It's, uh, uh, we, must, we must never make the mistake of thinking that the mind is only the, 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 the verbal part of the mind, that the mind is only the words we use to think the mind with. Uh, that that uh, th there's so much more um, that lies behind words, that lies alongside words, that can never be conveyed by words. And as we've acquired the methods uh, that Freud said to Fleece, we just don't have. As we've acquired those methods, so we must acquire a language and a conceptual armamentarium, a way of thinking about the mind, which incorporates everything else that we've learned about what lies behind this, the screen of language. Um, and I, I uh, as you know, am very excited about the fact that that time has come to us, which reminds me that there was also a point I didn't make explicit at the end of my own presentation when I said that Freud said to Fleece, I know, but you know, I haven't the methods. Um, uh, uh, the point I didn't make explicit, which was only implicit in what I said, is that that's why he stayed with psychology, because ironically, psychology at that point was a more empirical, more scientific way of proceeding, because at least there Freud could make observations and he could test them in the form of interpretations, and he could revise his hypotheses accordingly. And he explicitly did so. And if you read his way of developing his theory, that's what he did. And it was more scientific than having recourse to what was really pseudoscience of, of, of guessing what kind of neurons and what kind of energies and forces and whatnot might be operating in the biological substratum. It's, it's, it, I find it ironic because Freud is derided as being not a proper scientist because, you know, it was all just words and fluff, uh, whereas in fact it's quite the opposite. Uh, Freud abandoned the project precisely because that was a mythology and that the, the psychology that he developed at that time was the most scientific and empirically valid way to proceed. Um, the, 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 what your, your first point about language uh, uh, not only being a system uh, of communication is also terribly important. Um, language is a mode of thinking. And what you were saying about each language, and that's the, the, the infamous Wolfian hypothesis, which actually convey, has a lot of truth to it. There is a great deal of truth to the linguistic part of the mind being you know, st structured, uh, 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 contained in the language and the culture of that language. Uh, your examples about, um, about the Inuit uh, uh, nouns uh, and the, uh, and the, the, the Mandarin um, uh, pictograms, which incidentally have become more abstract recently. There's been a formal change, trying to make them um, less uh, pictographic, but still the residues of it are, um, are, are, in, the, are in the language. Um, I think, I mean, I can only agree with you completely. If I could just make one sort of random observation along those lines. In, in, in my work, uh, I, I work mostly with neurological patients, and it's a very interesting observation made many times by many, many, many uh, 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 neurologists over, over the time, over the decades, that uh, aphasics who cannot communicate uh, have far from lost language, you know, that they think in language um, and they behave in every way perfectly sensibly and reasonably using what Freud would call secondary process cognition, you know, uh, precisely because their mind is still structured, their ego functions are still structured by language. Language is, uh, is not just a tool for communication. In fact, it is secondarily a tool for communication. It's first and foremost a method of thinking. It's a, it's a, a way of structuring uh, abstractly uh, our, uh, and symbolically our thought processes. Communication is a, is, a, is a byproduct of being able to think in that sort of way.
Um, and then there's also the sort of self-regulatory function of language, which is also perfectly intact in aphasic patients. And patients who lose, frontal lobe patients who lose that self-regulatory superego function of speech, uh, they communicate perfectly fine, um, if a little bit inappropriately. <laughs> um, on the last point, and I'm sorry, I, I, I'm overstaying my welcome again, uh, about uh, Bewusstsein and Bewusstheit and, uh, 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 sorry, Unbewusstsein and, and, and uh, das Unbewusste and so on. Uh, all I can say is that uh, please note how s subtle and sophisticated was Strachey's understanding of the complexities of what he was doing. And it's really, I think we owe that guy an apology. You know, it's really quite appalling the way in which he's been caricatured and demonized in the secondary literature. The fact that people haven't taken the trouble to read what Strachey actually says about these things um, is, 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 has, you know, is more of the basis for their criticism than, than, than uh, what actually exists in Strachey. Strachey comments a great deal on all of these matters. Uh, but he doesn't make a great big song and dance of it. You know, he assumes that most people just want to read the Freud as if, you know, the, as if they were reading him in German, they were English, so they want to read him in English. They don't want to be burdened by all of these technicalities. But they are all there. And I have nothing to add to what Strachey said um, about, uh, about the, what is lost in translation there. Uh, and uh, all, that, all that I have done is um, expanded upon uh, these comments uh, and drawn attention properly too. I made a list of notes, uh, for example, of uh, where Strachey commented on the, te on the translation of various technical terms so that people can, uh, are, it's, are more aware if I want to read Strachey's uh, comments on these things, here's where they are, here's where he comments on this concept, this concept, this concept, this concept, and then I, I have myself written 90 pages um, of further commentary. Um, along those sorts of lines. All you can do is educate the reader about these things. You can't get away from the problems inherent in translation. Thank you for your very enjoyable and erudite comments, Eric. All right, I would like to help you uh, get your lunches. They are available in the back, the Slusser Room, where you got your coffee and tea. Um, we'd like you to form three lines um, because there's one line for each lunch you may have ordered. So if you ordered grilled chicken sandwich, there will be a line for that. There'll be a volunteer with each line um, to check off your name. You can just pick up your box lunch and, and uh, bring it in here. So. I would like to close the morning and invite you to... Oh, um, we start at 1.30. Margaret, can you indicate where each line is? Uh, you'll, I, I haven't seen the setup in there. Oh. So, uh, but there are volunteers. They'll all be in the back room. <laughs>